Uh, my name is Alex Nelson. I'm from the Kansas City Public Library. I'm the National Digital Inclusion Project Coordinator there. And we are here today to talk to you about the Accelerating Promising Practices grant, things we learned from it, and things we can apply in other areas of librarianship and libraries as a whole, hence the name of our presentation, Accelerating Promising Practices, Innovative Ways to Meet Community Needs. So thank you so much for all attending. I will have uh, my co-panelists introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Beth Gucci, and I am with the Web Junction program at OCLC. Hi, I'm Ellen Brooks, and I work with WILS, which is uh, the Wisconsin Library Services. Great. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Betha. And we are here, as I said, to talk about the Accelerating Promising Practices program and what we've learned from it. But before we can actually talk about that, we need to know what is the Accelerating Promising Practices program. So as you can see up here behind me, I've got a slide with some pictures explaining it. And just for clarity and brevity's sake, I'm going to refer to Accelerating Promising Practices Program as APP or APP because it's quite a mouthful to say over and over and over again. Uh, but the APP program is a grant-funded program funded by IMLS, or the Institute of Museum and Library Services. So their support, both financial and in terms of other resources, has been absolutely instrumental. So a big thank you to IMLS because they are literally the foundation of this project, and without them, uh, it would have been impossible or very, very difficult to happen. But it all starts at the top with IMLS as the funders, and then different libraries all across the United States apply for this grant, and they are grouped into cohorts based on their similar project areas that they work on, which we'll get to in a minute. So each library that applies for this grant has their own individual project that they are working on, and they are grouped into, uh, grouped with, I should say, with what are called mentor organizations. So that's what Ellen, Betha, and I represent. Uh, we are part of the mentor institutions of this project. And the mentor organizations work with these cohorts of libraries in the capacity that they are a larger institution or oftentimes a urban institution. This grant is geared towards small and rural libraries, and all the mentor institutions are organizations that have a little more capacity in certain areas, which is not to say they are better or worse. In fact, we've had the experience of working with small and rural libraries have known that they can do quite a lot of things that our big urban institutions can't. But it's often considered that the urban institutions, the larger institutions, have a greater access to a breadth and depth of resources than the rural institutions might. So the mentor organizations are there to serve as resources and support for the libraries. They are also there to serve as a liaison between um, IMLS and the other libraries in the cohort. And the three cohort areas are right up there on the far uh, right or left, depending on how this room is set up and where you're sitting. Uh, but they are school libraries, community memory, and digital inclusion. And so each one of us represents one of those areas. And you'll hear from each one of us today talking a little bit more about what our cohorts have done, the great work they've done, and the great work we've done together. So I will first pass it over to Betha, and she will come and talk about school libraries. Great. Thank you, Alex. Um, so our cohort was transforming school library practices. And again, this is working with uh, schools and school libraries in small and rural communities. We had a total of 15 of these libraries and the IMLS funding for their projects was to help them transform their practices in their schools and particularly centered around the library. Um, there were different projects, so each of the 15 had a specific set of things, objectives that they wanted to accomplish, but they all had very common goals. And these were primarily redesigning their libraries, the physical space to begin with, as 21st century learning environments. Um, they also would then move to enhancing the programs and their services in order to better prepare students for success in the world in which we live. Um, they also were really wanting to develop collaborations with all of the stakeholders, so with students, staff, families, and communities in ways that they hadn't been able to before. And they, I don't know that they wanted to become leaders, but that was part of the, um, the overall objective of this acceleration is to help school librarians become leaders within the schools. So, Transformation was definitely needed. I think for most of the participants, their library had been reviewed, had been viewed as just a place to check out books. And the librarians were just viewed as clerks or audiovisual aids. 
Um, I think the poster child for our group of school librarians was um, a community in which the library had been, the school had been built new 15 years ago, and the library was actually designed to be the center of the school. So it was in the center of the building, it had lots of natural light, but it, that didn't happen. And over the last 15 years, it became more and more um, neglected. In fact, for five years, it was a classroom. And then more recently, it was the detention center and the holding place for students. So it actually acquired a negative connotation. Mm. So very, very unfortunate um, for that school library. And as the librarian said in, in her own words, it was neither a modern information space nor a modern learning space. I think that's kind of an understatement. Um, an example from another library, this is quoting um, that school librarian who said, the outdated space reflected the teaching staff's outdated attitudes toward the library and librarians. So um, obviously no collaboration going on there. So let's look really quickly at some of the transformations that happened. So starting with actually transforming that physical space. This is just one example from one of the 15. They were all very dramatic. I love before and after pictures. <laughs> so you can see before, it was a nice library, had lots of books, nice tables, but it was ordinary and fairly static. And transformation of physical space involves building in more flexibility. So lots of flexible furnishings that can be rearranged for different kinds of student engagement and interactions, places that students want to sit down and hang out in, so they really want to spend more time in the library. And um, a lot of libraries had maker spaces. I don't have a photograph of one here, but you can just see making them more vibrant, more colorful, more inviting, so that the students want to spend time there. Then another major transformation goal was student engagement. In fact, that's why you make the space inviting, is so that you can engage students. And um, you can see these wonderful structures are all made by students. Uh, most of the participating libraries did do some kind of maker space. If they didn't have dedicated room, they had maker equipment, maker things, um, and just wanting to set up the circumstance where students could come in and actually develop their own learning paths around the making. Um, I love the um, a quotation from this one library who set up a makerspace. She said, when the library gave the students the materials to create, they went to town. Students took what they learned and made it their own. So it, was, it really was, if you build it, they will come and they will make and they will learn. And then also that really important piece about um, beginning to collaborate with teachers, which you might think was a natural relationship, but it's one that librarians usually have to instigate and nurture. Um, and I love, we have some really good quotations from participants who were able to make that bridge, saying that this experience has given me more confidence to engage and support students and teachers. And from another um, participant, she said that students are able to think independently, realize their potential by pursuing interests, making connections, and this is all because of the opportunities the library presents to collaborate and to link curriculum standards together with learning. So that really magic combination of um, collaborating with teachers to follow the curriculum and adhere to standards, but also alight the possibilities for self-directed student learning and inquiry-based learning. So our mentor role, um, this, and I think that there's some commonalities across the three cohorts, is the things that we provided. We had monthly online training sessions on topics that we found were uh, things that our grantees wanted to learn more about to really be able to develop their projects. We did coaching individually to support people as needed. We have, uh, or will have had soon, three multi-day convenings, originally designed to be all in person, but obviously we switched direction and um, two of them were virtual. I still have fingers crossed that our final convening with our second cohort will be in person in August. Um, and then we also created a community of practice on the Web Junction Learning Management platform. 
And overall, uh, we were helping them strengthen their role, the role of their libraries themselves and their libraries as dynamic learning centers. But as this slide says, we learned so much from them. So I got a new appreciation. After working with public libraries for many years, small and rural, I got a full appreciation of school libraries. Um, they have a really unique place in the school community, the environment, because students have a new teacher every year, but they see their library, librarian every week or even every day over the span of their K-12 education. And the librarians interact with these students year after year as they progress, so they really build relationships over the long term and have that ability to spur their lifelong learning. Um, a common thread that emerged across all of our participants was the tremendous, well, was the real need to advocate confidently and continually with all of the stakeholders in their community about how valuable they are to the whole school environment. It's not a given. It's not that everybody knows this. In fact, we may talk about that later in our, in our discussion portion of this, but they really are that locus for student-led inquiry and self-directed exploration, and they really are that hinge for becoming a, a true 21st century, really empowering learning environment. And this quotation from one of our participants, I would like to see the district as a whole come around to thinking that school libraries have a lot to offer and are more embedded in our classrooms. And then lastly, just a couple of quotes from the final evaluation from the first cohort. This experience has been amazing. Thank you for all of the support. So mentors, of course, love to hear that. And it has been a privilege and one of the most beneficial professional learning experiences of my career. And just uh, want to briefly acknowledge that this was made possible by the support of IMLS and the ongoing support we receive from OCLC. Thanks. Thanks, Betha. Thank you, Alex. It's been great to work with both of you. So I am going to talk about um, the community memory cohorts. Uh, my name is Ellen Brooks, and um, my official title for this project is Community Memory and Digital Archives Consultant. Um, I'm actually uh, mostly in practice an oral historian, uh, and I am not a librarian, so I learned a lot about libraries and librarians, and I'm still learning, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, so first I want to tell you a little bit about WILLS, which is the organization that I work with um, that was the mentor organization for this project. So formally, uh, Wisconsin Library Services, it's a nonprofit membership organization that facilitates collaborative projects and services to save our members time and money and to advance library service, primarily in the state of Wisconsin. Most of our members are libraries, but we also work with cultural institutions, government agencies, and other nonprofits to develop partnerships and projects. So, um, and then the other definition of sorts that I wanted to give up top is exactly what is community memory. Um, so for that, I was gonna kind of quote from IMLS um, and how they define community memory or how they think about community memory in terms of accepting folks uh, for this grant project. So IMLS supports the role of libraries and archives as trusted stewards of our nation's knowledge and collection, as well as their ability to serve as trusted spaces for community engagement and dialogue. We are interested in projects that engage local communities in the collection, documentation, and preservation of their local histories, experiences, and identities. So with that said, I will tell you a little more about our cohorts. So uh, this map shows the geographic variety of both of our IMLS APP cohorts. We had um, 10 uh, libraries participate in our first cohort. Those are the blue dots on this map. And then we had seven uh, participate in our second cohort, and those are the purple dots on this map, including Antioch, Alaska, way up there. <laughs> um, and I actually came on board right at the end of the second, or right at the end of the first cohort. So most of my experience has been with the second cohort. So to that end, I just thought I'd start with an example. 
of one of our cohort members' projects just to kind of give you a more concrete idea of what types of projects our cohort has been working on. So this is all of Belfast Climate, Di Climate Dialogues, also known as ABCD. Um, it is a part of the Belfast Free Library, Belfast Maine um, Library programs, and the project manager is Brenda Harrington. The project goals are to engage a broad cross-section of Belfast in talking about climate, curate high-quality education materials regarding climate change, develop and support programming to normalize conversation on climate, and to archive a full range of Belfast area residents' ideas and priorities regarding climate change. So this, um, what you're looking at right now, is the art of reclimatation, reclimation, I think is how they're saying it. Um, it is an exhibit uh, shown here. It was also, um, it was a physical exhibit as well as a currently a web exhibit. Um, and it's one example of how Brenda and the Belfast Library are encouraging the Belfast community to think and talk about climate change and to share and document their reflections. This is another um, example of this community art and kind of uh, an explanation of um, what it is, what the um, purpose is, and, and how they're getting it together. So um, I picked this one because uh, it's a great project and also it's very visually stunning. Um, but I also wanted to mention some of the other topics our cohort is working on. So we have um, community gardens and gardeners in Philadelphia. Uh, the craft beverage and brewing community in the Finger Lakes region of New York, and documenting Central State Hospital, which was once the largest mental health hospital in the world in Milledgeville, Georgia. And, and that those specific projects are in addition to the general community memory collecting, sharing and preserving, including setting up memory labs, scanning days, and recording interviews and conversations. So, we um, decided to kind of focus on a specific aspect of the IMLS um, grant project, which was capacity building. And that was um, a little sticky at points in terms of everybody understanding exactly what that means. Um, and it's still kind of a, a definition in work. Um, but I thought, again, I would read the IMLS um, interpretation of what that means. So IMLS strengthens the capacity of museums and libraries to improve the well-being of their communities. Uh, this means recruitment, training, and development of library and museum workforces, sharing and adoption of best practices and innovations, identification of trends to help organizations make informed decisions, and serve as trusted spaces for community engagement and dialogue. So our cohort found that that last bullet point, serve as trusted spaces for community engagement and dialogue, really resonated the most with the work that they were doing and their projects. And then we came up together with this kind of working definition for capacity building that we adopted. Um, and that is cohort working definition developing the skills, knowledge, infrastructure, and relationships you need to do the work you want to do for your grant period and beyond. So in practice, that could look like um, building the library's reputation and role in the community as a trusted resource for community memory and local history. It can look like building sustainable, lasting relationships with community partners. It can look like creating workflows and documentation to solidify project steps and use in the future. And it can look like obtaining and setting up equipment for digitizing or recording community materials. So these are some of our areas of focus, um, understanding community and some possible topics, digital skill building, possible topics, and preparing for future work, and then some possible topics there as well. So we did end up covering a lot of these um, during the time um, that we worked with this cohort. But we did find that one of our challenges as a mentor orga organization was to determine the, what tools and resources and conversations would be most useful for our cohort participants versus what we as an, a mentor organization assumed would be most helpful. Um, so that was a bit of a learning situation there. Um, and while the topic of community memory drew our cohort together, there was still a range of projects and objectives and resources that made it impossible to develop a curriculum that was one size fits all. What works for Antioch, Alaska is not necessarily gonna work for the Pennsylvania Horticulture Society. 
Um, so we learned relatively quickly that we had to be flexible, not only in the content that we shared with the cohort, but also in the method in which we shared that content. So we did a lot of scaling um, for best practices and advice for the variety of organizations that we were working with. So how we did that um, is the similar to what Betha mentioned, and I, I think Alex's cohorts did the same or similar. Um, we did monthly cohort meetings where we talked about big picture topics. We did quarterly one-on-one -on -one check-ins, which were um, the Will's mentors and then just the person from that one organization, which gave us a chance to get to know them more personally and have them ask questions and just see how it was going. We did tool tryouts and tip sheets. So those were deeper dives into specific tools that folks might be interested in. And then we also um, emphasized networking, which meant connecting the cohort members to other people doing the same work. Um, and then not on here was also in-person meetings. Um, we did, we were all meant to do three in-person meetings over the course of two years. Um, cohort one did one in-person meeting at the beginning of their projects. And cohort two just met for the first time here in DC um, to do our first and last in-person meeting. So that was lovely. I just wish we had met beforehand. Um, so um, these all worked for most folks with varying degrees of success. But given the upheaval caused by the pandemic, there was a consistent feeling of being behind or underachieving, and I did check with the cohort members and they did agree that this, that was a, cor a correct statement. They, there was this feeling of being behind or underachieving based on their original project proposals, which led us to kind of reconsider what our most important role may be as mentors, which led us to the second challenge, which we will also uh, talk about a, li a little bit more together. Um, but essentially dealing with COVID and how it changed project plans and cohort activities. Um, so what we really ended up doing was kind of, especially in the beginning of uh, cohort two activities was focusing on moral support and encouragement and relationship building um, and less so on, are you getting it done? Are you checking off the boxes? Um, are you trying to fulfill every single step of your project process? Um, so I thought I'd just uh, read a little quote from a blog post that I wrote in May 2021. In light of all the challenges COVID has brought, one thing that the Wills team is constantly trying to impress on our cohort members as well as ourselves is that success for these projects does not mean a perfectly curated website or 100 newly cataloged photographs or even a project that, be con that can be considered formally complete. Success is building the capacity and the confidence to do more community memory-based projects in the future. So I thought I would just leave you um, with some of these thoughts from our first cohort. Uh, they were asked what advice or what words they might share with the second cohort, and these were some of their responses. Um, as previously mentioned, one thing that we found particularly effective was to facilitate building relationships or at least making connections with outside experts but also within the cohorts, including connecting folks from cohort one with cohort two. And we found that talking to folks who have been there um, really helped our cohort members both practically as well as emotionally. And then I will just leave you with this quote from our um, IMLS community me memory cohort program officer, Cindy Landrum. She said, small and rural libraries are important community assets. Participating in these communities of practice enables these organizations to cultivate networks and access valuable resources, ideas, and knowledge that build on the vital services they provide for their communities. Thanks. All right, and so then we're gonna uh, finish off the explanation of the different mentor organizations with me and the Kansas City Public Library. So if you look onto your screen there, the picture on the right, the top is the Kansas City Public Library logo inspired by the branch on the bottom. That's our central branch. Um, it used to be a, a bank, actually, funny enough. And we've got a room called the vault that used to be uh, where they hold, held all the money in the bank that we now have film screenings there. So a little fun fact about the Kansas City Public Library. But our aspect of the IMLS grant was digital inclusion. And that part of the grant was dedicated to or delegated to our tech access team, which I'm a part of. And so I feel like reading the motto or the mission statement of the Tech Access Team really gives us a, a good idea of what 
we are trying to accomplish with this grant. And the, the mission statement is as follows, and we spent a lot of time in our team meetings working on what exactly this meant. Connect Kansas City Public Library and communities to promote digital inclusion, technology proficiency, and lifelong learning among adults. But that, of course, begs the question, if you don't know, what is digital inclusion? And the IMLS defines digital inclusion as the ability of individuals and groups to access and use information and communication technologies. So basically, I like to think about it as making sure everyone has equal access to and knowledge about how to use technology. There are five pillars of digital inclusion that we often talk about on the Tech Access team. And these are device, so do you have the actual thing you need to use to connect to the internet or do whatever you need to do, cell phones, iPhones, tablets, that sort of thing. Do you have an internet connection? Do you have the skills and knowledge how to use that device? Do you have tech support in case, as something invariably will, will go wrong with your device? And application, do you know how to apply those tech support skills and your knowledge to that device in the future so you can be self-sustainable with it? And so we worked with two cohorts focusing on digital inclusion, uh, one group of 10 and one group of three. And I'll talk a little bit more about those here. So first we have uh, a picture of one of our cohorts. This is the Bishop Mueller, or one of our libraries, excuse me. This is the Bishop Mueller Library in Briarcliff University in Iowa. It's a small private liberal arts college. So it's uh, curating mostly to undergraduate students who are you know, around their, their late teens, early 20s. And this, I think, shows the, the depth and breadth and the diversity of digital inclusion projects because we worked with libraries who were working with uh, people who were going through the cycle of incarceration. We worked with libraries who were working with children, who were working with adults. Digital inclusion, as I've heard throughout this conference even, is so many different things and it's very, very important because it touches so many different people. So their project was a digital media creation studio. Students could learn how to use things like Photoshop, uh, iMovie, other editing softwares. They could make podcasts, movies, edit pictures, and most importantly, they could learn those skills and apply those skills later on in their life. So in their career searches or in their professional setting or you know, just for fun in your personal life, those are all really valuable skills as the modern age advances. And so the Bishop Mueller Library had, first of all, the creation of this digital creation studio, and then also they offered and are currently offering um, digital literacy classes to help their students understand and know how to use it. And we also, uh, just like Ellen, have got a, a map of where all of our cohort members are from up on the screen. The blue states are from cohort one and the states with the black stars on them are from cohort two. So we had, as you can see, a lot of diversity. Ellen had someone up in Alaska and we had someone from San Juan, Puerto Rico. So really all of the United States, I think we just missed out on Hawaii, we would have had the whole thing covered. But that's a little bit about our grants and um, I, all the things that Ellen and Betha mentioned, we did too. We had monthly meetings, webinars, all things like that, all building capacity and building relations with our cohort members to try and foster program success. So now we're gonna go and we're gonna switch between the podium <laughs> and the, wow, this is louder than I thought it was. All right, well, we're gonna switch between the podium and the panel now and we are going to have a little channel our inner FDR, right? Because we are in DC and have a little fireside chat. So I want to first propose a, a question to our panelists and I will be answering these questions too. So in case anyone is weirded out by me answering my own questions, <laughs> I'm just the one with the questions. The first question that I would like to pose to our panel is the pandemic. Obviously the pandemic was a huge impact on libraries as a whole, but I'd like to talk a little bit about how it impacted your work and the work of your cohorts as well. So. Either of you can go ahead and start. Sure. I guess I can just move this. Um, so in addition to, well, I guess we should specify, um, Cohort 1 wrote their project proposals in 2019 and, and had gotten started already um, by the time the pandemic happened. Um, so they were mid-project, I'd say, um, by the time that happened. Cohort 2 had also written their proposals before the pandemic, and but hadn't gotten started until after uh, we were in the pandemic. So that all of that is to say everyone wrote their project proposals pre-pandemic, so there was a lot of our favorite word, pivoting. So, um, so that was obviously hard, helping people um, kind of rearrange their project goals. Um, we, for example, in the community memory cohort had a lot of um, people who were planning to do in-person interviews, uh, community gatherings, scanning days, a lot of in-person things. Um, so we had to help uh, our cohort members kind of reimagine um, what that would look like, um, as well as offer them 
and we can talk about this a little bit more as well, but extensions, um, a lot of the people from cohort one, uh, and I believe from cohort two, have been or will be taking extensions on their projects so they can try to hit some more of their aims that are a little more doable now. Um, and then the other major thing I would say was, and I, this came out in a recent evaluation that was done of cohort one, the first in-person meeting to introduce everyone, it really helped the cohort bond um, and it really had an impact on the rest of their time together. So missing out on that for cohort two, um, I think it made it a little bit difficult for people to really bond, open up, get to know each other. Um, so that we did have a two two day um, virtual meeting when we started cohort two. Um, so you know, something was better than nothing, but I do think we missed out on that in person and I'm glad we were able to do it here in DC. And um, I can say ditto on some of that. All of our grantees submitted their applications before the pandemic, so all the projects were framed in terms of the way everything was before. And also ditto on the convening experience. The first cohort got there in person. It was, uh, I wasn't participating at that point, but apparently it was like hugely successful, very rewarding. Bonding happened. People said, I found my people because school librarians are it definitely in small and rural communities, they're essentially solo librarians. They're, they're the it in the whole school. Everyone's a teacher or an administrator. Um, and with cohort two, we didn't get to do that and had the same experience. Not only was it a smaller size cohort, but they didn't get that initial in-person bonding experience, which I hate to concede that because I have worked on projects. Uh, Web Junction, we've worked virtually with people exclusively and had a lot of excess, but it takes a lot of time. It mm -hmm. takes time if you're doing everything virtually to start developing those relationships. Um, so I feel like school librarians and their particular projects, they really got some enormous challenges. For one thing, their projects were to transform engagement with students in a physical space, using physical materials, um, having students lead their inquiry by peer sharing and I mean it's all about people being together in a physical space and that had to change um, and I, I, all, I think most of our grantees did apply for extensions because they still have that goal in mind they still want to be able to have engagement at that level that said um, they're very resourceful. I'm, I'm going to quote one of my colleagues in a minute about just how amazed we are at the resourcefulness and creativity of school librarians. Um, so they, they did things, they understood that not only was the, the school closed, but, um, and students weren't getting the materials that they needed necessarily, so there was a material supply stream that libraries could fulfill, but that students weren't getting that social and emotional engagement that they get from an in-person experience in a school. And librarians were particularly attuned to that because of their longer-term relationships they have with the student body. So they, they did amazing things, like um, they created online versions of the library. I don't know if anybody here is, is familiar with Bitmoji, but it's a wonderful kind of um, animated 2D interactive space that kind of tries to replicate what the library does as much as you can in a virtual world. Um, and they did, they provided kits of project materials so that people could do uh, take home making things. Um, they had online book clubs and virtual author presentations. One of our librarians even placed ha handwritten jokes in the books that the students were picking up to keep that personal connection, like there's a human at either end of this. We're talking to each other. Um, they even coordinated efforts to provide food and meals to their communities. The other real major challenge for them is, and I'm maybe going to talk about more about this later also, is that um, in this crisis situation, the focus shifted totally to how are we meeting our standards and how are we delivering curriculum and how are, we, how are our students getting the learning they need 
and like, oh, well, there's that school library, but they're closed, so that's off to the side. So that um, many of our grantees became like virtual room monitors, or they became, um, you know, the supply, we're going to supply the, the books for, they, they just became too easily irrelevant, and that's where um, that was a huge impediment in them being able to make any kind of progress in their projects until they could kind of um, inch their way back <laughs> into the acknowledgement of how valuable they were. Yeah, great, thank you both. And we'll get to that point in a minute, Betha, but I wanted to say too, on the pandemic, and Ellen, you said everyone's favorite word is pivot, and you know that's certainly true, and I'm sure you all in the audience have heard quite a lot about adapting from the pandemic and what we've learned because it's been quite a big topic in the field of libraries recently. But what I wanted to say is that one thing that I think that we have learned through this project that is a little bit different but still comes out of the pandemic is that, number one, relationships are key. You can form really great relationships with other libraries. Heck, they don't even have to be libraries. We collaborated and had our libraries collaborate with local nonprofits that are working in digital inclusion, uh, local partner agencies that our library partners with. It is crucial to create and cultivate relationships, whether you're on Zoom or not on Zoom, just because you can help get work done a lot more easily with a lot more people doing it. And then number two that I wanted to say is that uh, you both also touched on this, but in-person meetings are so, so, so helpful. I know in the age of Zoom, it is really easy to, oh, we'll do it hybrid. Oh, you know, I don't wanna go get coffee. I'll just, you know, stay in my bed and get Zoom. But I think anytime you're working, especially with a new group of people, an in-person meeting is just really, really helpful. And maybe we all knew that already, and this is just stating the obvious, but it's nice to maybe sometimes state the obvious so we can reiterate it a little bit. And now I wanna move on to another question. Um, and Betha, you and Ellen have touched on this a little bit, but a large part of your project seemed to revolve around advocacy and advocating for capacity building in your own libraries or Betha at school libraries advocating them that yes, we're here and we're worth something and we're worth fighting for. Could you talk a little bit more about you know, what advocacy means to you in, in your specific project and what it meant to your, your grantees at the start and then at the end of the project? Yes, I love to take this one. And as I said earlier, it was a common thread that emerged when we were working with our grantees is this need for advocacy. Um, I'm going to quote a little bit from study. There actually haven't been a whole lot of studies done on school libraries, but um, Keith Curry Lance and Deborah E. Catchell have really been prominent in, in um, studying the value of school librarians. And in their most recent study, which was pre-pandemic, well, they've actually reviewed multiple studies. They're often done at a state level, so they um, aggregate them and, and look at the, the national picture. Um, but they found that the most substantial and consistent finding is a positive relationship between full-time qualified school librarians and scores on standards-based language arts, reading, and writing tests, regardless of student demographics and school characteristics. So there's solid data that really supports the intense value that school libraries and librarians provide. And in spite of that, there has been a very unfortunate trend um, called, uh, over the last several years, not just pandemic, but a trend to, for school budget controllers to see the library as something extraneous or something not all that necessary, like, hey, we have a public library in the community. And so positions have been cut, and this is also from Lance and Catchell from 2018-2019, uh, which is the most recent study, that uh, over a decade, um, there were 20% fewer school librarians in schools across the country. So that's a huge reduction, and I can only imagine, if I'd love to find some data on this, I can only imagine it's a lot worse as a result of the pandemic. So there's that level of like just baseline advocacy, school librarians matter, um, get the word out to everyone who will listen to you. And then there was the, layered on that, the need to advocate for an evolving school library. So all of our grantees are amazing people. They get the vision of a 21st century learning environment they're excited, they want to bring in um, the materials and set the environment so that this, this student-led learning can happen. But they need to convince everybody. Sometimes they'll have a, a, a superintendent who's, who's in on it. Um, often the, they need to really advocate for themselves with the teachers. 
with uh, parents and caregivers, um, community members at large, so, and it's a continual thing. So it was um, something that we were able to, I, I believe as mentors, we were really be able to support them in acknowledging this need. You know, it's not, it's not anything that they were doing wrong. It's like there is a need and we're helping to them to build the skills that you can acquire to actually be a more successful advocate. And I'll, I'll say on, on our end too, we weren't working with quite the same level of libraries. You know, um, small and rural libraries doing digital inclusion projects face altogether different challenges than school libraries. But I'll say for, for our group, one thing that we learned as a member of a big organization, and also I hope the small and rural libraries learned, is of the power of small and rural libraries and the work that they can do. Because oftentimes they're cornerstones of their community and several of the librarians we worked with were one of the only librarians or one of two, one of three, a small number. And you think, you know, when you have that sort of a smaller size, you have less ability, less resources, but that's not the case at all. In fact, we have had several of our librarians that we worked with go on to be you know, members of their, their town's community, the city council, uh, advocating on behalf of the library at the town meetings for other resources. The work that small and libraries do, or small and rural libraries, excuse me, do, is incredible because oftentimes that smallness and the, the maybe more secluded nature of them gives them an extra room to maneuver, an extra capacity to do that. So we learned that as, as a bigger institution, and I hope they learned that working with us as well. So it's a little bit of teaching themselves about self-advocacy too. All right, and then I've got uh, another question here kind of off the back of that. And then after this question, I think we're gonna open it up for Q&A. So uh, if you have a question, you can line up. I think there's a microphone right there, and it doesn't look like there's one on the other side of the room. So there's just the one. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to line up and we'll take it after this. And don't worry if you don't, because I've got some more planned that we could talk about this all day. Uh, but the, the question that I wanted to pose to Ellen and Betha again is uh, along the lines of capacity building again, we've sort of danced around it and I wanna get really into it, which is what do you think is the most successful or most helpful thing to build your library's capacity? That can be in whatever terms you want. It doesn't mean you know they produced X many community memory sessions, but just in terms of building capacity, being successful in general, what do you think was the most helpful aspect of this project? I think um, for our cohorts, the first thing that kind of springs to mind is building confidence. Um, building the confidence of these project managers and librarians to do this work again in the future. Um, we really tried to insist on the fact that we were learning for this project that they were working on, but also learning tools and tips and tricks for their next projects. And even if they wouldn't necessarily be using those exact tools or working on the like an exact similar project, I think the fact that they went through this and they went through this uh, with a cohort and they were showed so many they were shown so many examples of other folks doing this work. My hope is that they really gained the confidence that they may not have had before to try this work, to stick with it, um, and you know, just to feel more comfortable um, doing this type of work in the future. Um, I would say, so confidence, and then the other thing I, I would say I think is the capacity to essentially show that your library is a place that cares about you and wants to reflect your history. This is community memory, so the goal was for folks to see themselves in their library, um, whatever that meant. Um, we did not want to emphasize collecting, although that was a part of projects, some of the projects for our cohort. They were collecting interviews, they were collecting digitized materials, um, but for some of them, the, the goal was really just to build these relationships with their community. Um, so once you have a relationship built, then hopefully that is uh, something that is gonna sustain for quite a while and then um, that those folks will help with your next community memory project. So I would say, yeah, confidence as well as relationship building for our group. And again, I could say ditto <laughs> to both of those. Uh, building confidence is huge. It, it, is actually um, a forerunner to building the skills. If you don't have the confidence that you're gonna be able to do something with the skills, then it's, uh, 
probably not going to be very successful or productive. Um, I'm just going to read a couple of quotations that, that validate the confidence that we were able to, I mean, I don't want to take all the credit as a mentor organization. I think we fostered an environment where they built each other's confidence and also we could, we could um, help them recognize the value that they were bringing. So one is that um, everyone is becoming more resilient and flexible. We are all much more tech savvy now than we were just six months ago. We can engage with students and families in new ways. I think that was really rewarding to hear that. And I'm fortunate to have the mentor team and other grantees who are part of this process with me. It's been so beneficial to hear from others and take their experiences and adapt them to my own situation. So that value of the peer cohort, even though they're virtual, they're spread out across the country, they're very different locations. Uh, they did, and even the ones who haven't met in person yet, <laughs> they're still finding that value, especially for school librarians, of being able to connect with others um, in a way that they don't get to connect in their school community. And then on the digital inclusion side of things, I will say that if I was to give out one thing that helped our, our build capacity that uh, everyone in this room can hopefully take home with them and apply in their situation, whatever library, library system, or professional situation you find yourself in, it is how important and crucial partnerships have been. We have had an incredible amount of, of partners work with us and our cohort members and even in terms of you know, small passing things, for example, doing a monthly webinars has been a huge success and we've learned a lot, not only as mentor institutions, uh, but also as a cohort as a, in general. So the small libraries learning from the webinars and there are things we learned from the webinars too, that we produced all about digital inclusion. We did some on digital equity that sort of filled the EDI or JEDI side of things that you know, we had several members of our own library attend as well. So the biggest thing that we did that I think can be apl applied in any sort of context is Reach out, you know, it doesn't matter what programming you're doing, if it's digital inclusion programming, school library programming, community memory programming, or, uh, you know, um, thinking of my favorite thing at the library as a kid, Lego programming, le building with Legos at the library. You know, there are always great community partners, even if they're not libraries, for example, who you can partner with for, you know, just a day, just a week, uh, a year, a month. It doesn't need to be anything incredible, but working together with other institutions that are doing similar, even tangentially similar work has been incredibly powerful and incredibly rewarding for both the big library and the small libraries. Uh, and so with, with that, I think if anyone has a question, please feel free to, uh, to walk up to the microphone right over there for the, the Q&A process can officially begin. Uh, and like I said, I've got some backup questions, but I, I would like to hear from all of you if you do have any questions. So we will uh, let the Jeopardy theme play out in the background here and see. All right, well, while we wait for uh, people to, um, to think of some questions and, and come up there, I wanna ask uh, one more question. This is kind of segueing off of what I just talked about a little bit, is, is replication. So how do you both think that people could replicate some success that you've had? Obviously, circumstances can be different and there's no copy and paste button for libraries, but if you were to recommend somebody to try a best practices or something you learned, what would you say? Um, well, it's actually written into our um, deliverables as a mentor organization. We will be publishing on Web Junction uh, a toolkit, hashtag it's a toolkit, it's another toolkit. Um, that because we've, as we've been doing these training sessions over the now almost three years in response to what we understood our grantees needed, and we did a lot of what we call discovery interviews, so repeated conversations with them are like, okay, you know, especially when things really shifted, uh, what is it that you're really needing to know? So we've acquired a lot of resources, um, webinar snippets or training session recordings. I mean, we have a lot of these materials that we are aware are gonna be much more widely valuable than uh, just the 15 people who've benefited from them so far. So we will be organizing those and putting them on Web Junction sometime this fall. Um, and I guess that's what I would say, that we're, <laughs> that's what we're doing. 
Um, so because I think it's relevant to Alex's question, and I think maybe some folks in the audience might be uh, curious about this, I, I wanted to um, read this from IMLS, which is uh, the program status. Um, so this APP was a pilot initiative that was launched in 2018 as a commitment to supporting small and rural libraries. After two years, a program evaluation is underway to understand how this funding opportunity met the needs of these organizations and how IMLS can best serve grantees and their communities. So uh, as it stands, this project is not open anymore, but hopefully IMLS will be considering our feedback as well as the surveys um, and responses from our cohort members and hopefully potentially developing a similar program. Um, so to that end, I, I think one, thing that was a little difficult for us in terms of um, talk, thinking through like how we would do it, if we could do it over essentially, like if we could do it differently. Um, we might have wanted to be as Wills involved earlier in the process, maybe before um, the final grant projects were written, uh, because by the time the projects were written and kind of thought through, um, we, we didn't have a say in them obviously, so we just tried to help the libraries achieve the goals that they had set for themselves, where as it may have been better for everyone involved if we as a mentor organization could have helped them write their grants and could have helped them think through what was possible and help them think through um, the logistics and the reality of the expectations they were setting for themselves. So I do think that if this, is, this grant is a little bit of a, um, it's a very specific, uh, instance. So I do, if I think if anyone is looking at becoming a mentor or serving in a mentor role in this type of capacity, getting in at the ground floor um, is really important. And if you can't get in at the ground floor, at least having a very solid um, understanding of what the expectations are amongst everybody involved uh, as soon as you can. And I'll say off that too, you don't have to necessarily uh, apply for an IMLS grant to do some of the things that we've done too, even though those are all very good points. And I, I'm not disagreeing with any of you. But what I, I did want to say is that um, you can, you know, if you wanted to start your own sort of mentor project or be a mentor institution or maybe be a part of an organization that has a mentor institution, you know, building uh, coalitions is I think the way we've described it is, is can be really helpful. And just networking with other local libraries in your area at conferences like this and then meeting over Zoom just to talk about how things are going. Things that seem as small and as mundane as that can be really, really successful and beneficial. It's, it's sort of like, you know, the more people you talk to, the better, generally speaking. But I see we have a question, is, is that, uh, yes sir, you go ahead. I was curious, I was curious as to how you identify So do, do either of you want to take that one? Or? I, I can try. Okay. Um, so so we were not involved in the selection process. Um, IMLS uh, selected uh, the, the projects that would move on into the cohort. Um, we were um, selected. I don't actually, I don't know specifically how Wills was selected as a mentor org. So I don't know if you guys, do you folks know how you were selected? Um, but there was a criteria um, in the grant um, application that the cohort members had to fill out. Um, so the, like just like any other grant application, it, it was a lot of here's what we were looking to fund, here are the specifics in terms of um, what we want your project aims to be. Um, so that was um, how they, their approach, so they sent in their applications, um, they were selected, and then uh, only then did we meet them. So again, maybe would it suggest that be done a little differently in the future? Um, well, just adding that it was, as far as I understand, a competitive application process by the individual libraries to IMLS. So all the scrutiny that that goes through in the review process was applied to these small and rural applicants. Yeah, that, that is something that we didn't have a direct hand in. I think that's a commonality for all of us. And I want to say thank you for the question, by the way. I appreciate that. Uh, but it also interesting that we, we weren't able to directly select the cohort members, but that led to all sorts of different challenges where, you know, 
if IMLS is selecting them, and this is not to me uh, to be a slight on them, it's just that this is simply what the facts were, is that all the cohorts projects, at least that we worked with, they're all digital inclusion projects, but they're different. I mean, we talked about how we had some that were serving, you know, uh, undergraduate students. We had some who were serving people who were incarcerated. We had some who were serving, you know, senior citizens, some who were serving people who were uh, not at the highest digital literacy level. So a real challenge was, you know, obviously they weren't grouped by geographical terms, and they were grouped by digital inclusion, school libraries, and community memory, but those are really, really broad banners. And so I also would just like to take this opportunity to emphasize that, you know, you don't have to be doing the exact same thing to work with someone in a, in a cohort or to work with someone in a group setting. A lot of the projects were different. A lot of the projects served different people, and we still were able to come together and find ways to, you know, base our common ground off of good things and come to a good project end result, I think. so. Yeah, that, but that the actual selection process is an IMLS deal, as uh, my colleagues have said. Our Can I just, in, just in case anyone can't or doesn't want to make it to the microphone, um, if anyone wants to raise their hand, we can repeat a question. I just didn't want the microphone to be what was keeping questions from us. Okay, well, let's the, the microphone is, the way microphone is mobile now. But I, I'll just take these few minutes because I want to point out an interesting connection between uh, Web Junction and the Community History Project. Uh, Web Junction also has an IMLS grant and has been developing a course series in digital collection stewardship. So this is definitely aimed at small and rural publics and also at um, small tribal libraries, archives, and museums to help them understand how they can take their community history and turn it into a digital collection that can be, then be um, organized and shared. And in that course series, we are able to include interviews from three of the libraries that were in the community history project. So you can actually go in and learn a little bit more about their experience on all the levels of processes that are involved in creating these collections. And I think we've got just under, if I check the time here, we've got about four minutes left, so I'll do a uh, last call for questions, and then I will go ahead and ask uh, what will be my final question, which was, you know, any question? All right, well, uh, the, the final question I'll ask all of you, a little bit of a softball, but what do you think is, is the most enjoyable aspect of working with the library, smaller, rural, and just different from your own all across the United States. What, what was the most fun? Because at the end of the day, this is supposed to be a, a good thing. Uh, well, that's a softball for me. because um, Web Junction has a really strong focus on small and rural, and I've had the absolute privilege to work with them for years on a whole series of different projects. I have the deepest admiration for the resourcefulness, the resilience, um, the leadership that small and rural libraries have. And the, there, there are, I, I always forget the percentage, it's somewhere like between 70, 80% of the public libraries in this country are small and rural. They are the baseline, the, the strong, they're just amazing. So I'm honored to be able to work with them. Um, I think that's an interesting question because um, I'm thinking back to things that we tried to do at the beginning of our cohort um, getting together, and we we tried to do some like virtual happy hours and uh, like virtual team building, um, and I think that folks appreciated the attempt, but they didn't feel like they were they they didn't feel like they hit really, um, and that's okay. So we tried it. We felt like it didn't work necessarily, um, but that is part of as Betha was saying that it does take longer to grow relationships virtually so what we started doing was just 15 minutes before our cohort monthly meeting started we would just open up the zoom early folks could come and chat and catch up that was also like we invited people to use those 15 minutes to just like take you don't have to come early you can just use those 15 minutes to take a break from your last meeting get some water take a walk outside real quick um so i think that we learned that was just to kind of let things happen more organically. Um, and then I'd say for me, the most fun was just learning about different libraries and, and not even just the libraries, but learning about different parts. I can tell you about moose season in Antioch, Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can tell you a lot more about these interesting parts of the country that I didn't know about. So that was really fun. Yeah, I don't think I can top moose season. That, try, that's pretty try good. Alex. Uh, well, and then, uh, 
for us, it, I think it was just really the opportunity to get to work with so many different people. I mean, just the small and rural libraries, the partnerships that I mentioned, and then members of our own library. That was a, a great thing about being a mentor institution is when you, you often expand your own capacity by looking inwards and seeing, okay, what resources do we have that we can help? So I personally got to meet a lot of great people at Kansas City Public Library that I didn't know previously. Got to involve some departments that hadn't been involved in uh, previous projects with, with Tech Access before, which was nice. So anytime you can expand your own horizons, I think is, is, is good professionally and it's, it's good personally too. So yeah, that was my favorite. Not, not beating moose, moose season, I think, but. Anyway, well, I think that's everything we have. If you have questions for us, you can come up individually. We do have uh, this slide here, which um, oh. you all can take a moment to evaluate the program if you'd like. Uh, this is uh, something that the core leadership infrastructure and futures program is asking for us to do. So go ahead and uh, evaluate that if you would like. I'll flick to this slide and then we'll go back to it. But this is the, uh, the last ALA slide they have us on. And there you go, there's the, the QR code. So scan that with your phone if you'd like to evaluate us. And, that's it for us. Thank you all so much. You've been a great audience. We really appreciate it. And hope you all have safe travels back to wherever it is you came from. Thank you very much.